Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. So today I will tell you a little bit about novel single cell signal solutions and the beginning steps of data analysis. So during my talk, I will focus uh, first introduce to single cell sequencing, then I'll introduce you to the single runs technology, followed by pre-processing of single cell arrays of data, and then I'll introduce the case study for today's webinar. So first of all, why use, a, use single cell sequencing instead of bulk sequencing? And a good analogy is comparing a smoothie to a fruit bowl. So even though they contain the same ingredients, it's hard to take them apart and understand everything that is in the smoothie compared to a fruit bowl. So this is what you get from bulk sequencing. It's the average expression of the tissue and sample without understanding of all the cells that make it up. In a single cell, you are able to take apart every cell type, understand its transcriptome, also find new cell types that are present in very uh, small numbers, and also explore how these cells communicate with each other. So this field, this is applied to a multitude of fields, but is mostly interesting for uh, fields with high heterogeneity, such as cancer, where you not only want to understand the cells that make up the tumor, but also how it communicates with their microenvironment. Neuroscience, as you want to not only classify the neurons, but understand neural communication, immunology, to explore how the immune system responds to different stimuli, and finally, developmental biology, to explore the gene expression dynamics of developmental processes. So this field has been growing uh, quite fast in the last few years, and the way I look at this is to um, Look at the PubMed publications that use single cell RNA sequencing in the last few years. And you can see that only 2021, over 2,500 papers have been published. But how does this field uh, came to be what it is today? So it started in 2009, where only one cell in the first paper was sequencing. And first, we had the appearance of low throughput methods. Uh, currently, this low throughput methods focus on sequencing a low number of cells, but having a lot of information for each cell, such as SmartSeq, where you have full length transcript information for individual cells. Later came the high throughput methods that are mostly focused uh, to different. You have the nano droplets, where you have DropSeq and the 10x genomics, and the well methods, um, which is where single run comes. And these methods. Uh, focus on sequencing tens of thousands of cells okay. um, and having average uh, sequencing uh, transcriptome of each one of these cells. So now I would like to introduce you to the single arms technology. And our core technology is the scope shift. So this shift that you can see here has hundreds of thousands of wells. And the aim is to capture one cell and one bead per well. So attached to these beads, we have this. Uh, sequences that contain a PCR primer, a cell barcode, which is unique for each bead, and a UMI, which will be unique for each RNA molecule. Then we have a poly detail where the poly A of the mRNA molecule will be able to bind. In our system, you can visualize the process of loading this shape uh, in the microscope. As you can see here, you have the empty microwells. Then the cells are loaded, and you can observe the cell inside of the well. And finally, the beads are loaded and you can see the bead and the cell. So once you have the bead and the cell in the microwell, you can add the cell lysis, which will disrupt the cellular membrane and release the mRNA, allowing it to bind to the poly T sequences uh, present in the bead. This is followed by rust transcripting, transcription for an amplification and library construction. Once you have a sequencing library, you can sequence your sample. So it's important to note that the Loading of this shift doesn't require any instrument uh, besides a P200 pipette, so it's very easy to use. But Singular offers not only the core shift, but a complete single cell sequence uh, workflow, starting from tissue preservation and dissociation into single cell state. The loading of the shift that I talked to you about, both in a manual or automatized way using the matrix uh, instrument and library construction. When it comes to a library, you not only offer a single cell gene expression profile called JEXCO, where you get the full transcriptome of your cells, but also more specialized options, such as the immune profiling, the JEXCO VDJ, 
and the focal scope, which is a more targeted approach where you can design your own probes to capture things such as mutations or fusing genes. And finally, we have the Dynascope, where you can study time resolved transcriptomic dynamics by distinguishing between new um, and mature mRNA molecules. So when you use these libraries, you obtain something around like this, where you capture tens of thousands of cells for, for sample, and you are able to detect all cell types, include in very rare cell types that represent only around 0.15% of your sample. So with Singleron, you can also perform basic pre-processing data analysis by using the Celloscope software, software that I'm going to go into more detail later, and clinical uh, information and translation by using the Synecosys database. Uh, and you can do this in two options. You either acquire products and do it in your own lab, or it can be used um, as a service where you send us out your samples and we'll perform all the experiments and give you uh, the report back. But today we want to focus on how easy can it be to analyze single cell analysis data. And I'll focus on the pre-processing part. So let I'll just like to review some concepts so, so we can understand what happened here. So as I told you, you have a primer followed by a cell barcode, a UMI, and a poly T tail. So the mRNA molecule, the poly A, will bind to the poly T, and then we use a transcriptase that's going to elongate this molecule and add these uh, seeds in the end. This will allow the template switch oligo to bind that can then be used as a primer. So you have a primer here and a primer in blue, and you can amplify your library, your cDNA. After amplification, these fragments need to be um, fragmented and you need to add the read to primer and index. If you want to sequence more than one sample, you need to have a, a barcode that identifies that sample. And finally, the T5 and T7 uh, adapters for that are compatible with the Lumina sequencing. So when you sequence your data, there's two reads. Read one, that will compass the cell barcode, the UMI, and the poly detail, and the beginning of your insert or gene of interest, and the read two that captures the sample index and the gene. So let's just go over the importance of this barcode. So the cell barcode is unique for each bead and identifies your cell, and the UMI is unique for each cDNA molecule. And this allows you to correct for amplification bias. So when you perform amplification of the cDNA, then we're going to have multiple copies of this UMI. But you want to have an understanding of how much of each gene was in your cell. So you can collapse the multiple copies of UMIs into only one, giving you a better understanding of the RNA that was actually present in your cell. So next, uh, I told you, we generate the sample libraries. They can be sequencing. And the output of the sequencing are a fast few files. You take this file, and you run it to a pre-processing analysis pipeline that will output the count matrix that uh, then it can be used for downstream or secondary analysis. For pre-processing, we offer the cell scope software that takes a, gene exp um, a FASTQ file and outputs the gene expression matrix. And this is fully, freely available on GitHub and it can be downloaded and everyone can use it for themselves. So what are the steps present in this pipeline? So we start, as I mentioned, with a FASTQ file. And this is the basic structure of FASTQ file, but it's only important to note that you have the sequence and then you have a quality score for each base that was read in your sequence. So we want to know if your FASTQ files have high quality. And for that, you can use FASTQC report that'll give you basic metrics of the, the quality of your reads. And this is very easy to interpret, but usually you want your reads to be in the green part of the graph and not the yellow or the red. And this will just give you an idea if you can proceed with the analysis. So when your FASTQ files pass the quality control, you can do multiplex. And this me just means that you want to separate the reads based on the sample that they come from. So if I'm showing you in the indexes uh, in different colors, and you want to put all of the same color together. So sample one, two, and three. So now that you have different um, files for each one of your samples, you need to trim your reads. And trimming is just the process of removing these indexes that you don't need anymore 
and low quality bases. So bases from the class view file that had low quality can also be removed. And you want to keep for further analysis the sample reads, which contain the sun cell barcode, the unique molecular identifier, and the gene sequence. So, so far, you don't know to where the sequence, where to which gene it belongs in the genome. So you need to do alignment. And for this, you can use an aligner, such as star aligner, it's commonly used, that will match your RNA seq read to the exons in the genome. So now that you have the cell barcode UMI and the gene name, you can construct your count matrix. So this is a table where you have all of the cells in your sample and all of the genes in your genome, and you will count how many UMIs you'll have for each gene in every cell. So for example, there's three distinct UMIs for gene one and cell one, and only two for gene one and cell two. This count matrix can now then be used I'm sorry. And uh, after you run the cell scope, you get a report that mentions every step of this process. So first, you have the cell sample ID and the software version, so you know which one you use. You get information about the demultiplexing, so how many raw reads, how many reads were valid. When you trim the adapters, you can see how many reads then were too short, so you have to trim too much and you cannot use too, too short read. And then the mapping to the genome, so you need to know exactly which um, version of the genome you use, how many unique map, uniquely mapped reads. And this is important if you, because you only want to read to map to one space, uh, place in the genome. So you can identify the gene that it belongs to. And then you also have information to where in the genome these reads map to. So exonic, intronic, or intragenic regions. We also need to define how many cells are in your sample. And we do this by using the neat plot. So in this plot, we rank the barcodes, you can also call cells, based on, uh, in order the ones that have more to less year mice. And in the first deep of this neat plot is where we set the threshold of where is, what is the cell. So every barcode that has higher than this number of year mice is considered a cell and everything below this is not considered a cell. And this is because sometimes you can have um, RNA in your sample that is not actually attached to a cell, but will bind to the beads. And this will not be representative of a cell and will not have enough information for you to identify your cell disease. In this case, we identify around 7,000 cells in your sample. And cell scope will also give you a small analysis output so it's just some dimensionality reduction plot, so you can start looking into data. So after you use this, you need to process with secondary analysis, which will be the topic of Ricky's talk. But today, I'd like to introduce you to Synecosys database. So this is not a secondary analysis tool, but it's a database of published data. So what we do in this Synecosys database is that we collect um, available public data we manually curated, and we add clinical information, and we run this, this uh, data to the same pipeline, which means that you can then compare all of the data sets that are present because they went through the same uh, quality controls and measures and cell orientation. Important for clinical translations is that we add molecular level patient stratification. So we have information such as treatment, uh, the type of disease, the mutations that the patient has, and this will allow you to compare different conditions and perform analysis using these factors. And all of this is present in a user-friendly um, website that you can use, and you don't need to have any bioinformatic knowledge. It's just everything's explained. It's just a click with, with a click of a button. So I finally would like to introduce you to the case study of today. So uh, we are focused on the, this publication in Nature Communications from last year, and it worked on single cell profiling of tumor to genetically and the microenvironment in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So what the authors did was they collected biopsy samples of different cancers at different stages, no information about specific mutations present in these cancer patients, and also in their smoking status, if they ever smoked, if they still smoke, or if they have never done it. And 
And for that, they used the single round technologies. They used the tissue preservation in tissue dissociation buffer. And they used the JAX code trick so they perform the three prime single cell RNA sequencing these cells. And then they perform the pre processing analysis using the cell scope software that I described you uh, previously. And so, from what so far, now you can use the Selenic software that's going to be the topic of next uh, next talk to perform uh, secondary analysis. So this is it for my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention, and I think we can move to the next talk. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, let me just share my slides. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. As Anna uh, already said, I am Vicky Morrison. I'm the co one of the co-founders and the chief science officer at Biomage. And at Biomage, we're building Selenix, which is a tool that makes single cell RNA sequencing data analysis simple. Here, before I kick off, I would just like to tell you about some workshops that we have coming up. These workshops are completely free and they give you the opportunity to get hands-on experience using Selenix. You can find all of the details and the registration on our website at biomage.net forward slash upcoming dash events. I hope to see you at one of those web at one of those workshops. So I thought I would tell you a bit about my story before Biomage and how I ended up at Biomage in the first place. So before Biomage, I was a PI in immunology at the University of Glasgow, and I was interested in the heterogeneity of a specific subset of immune cells, which can have anti-cancer uh, phenotype or they can have a pro-cancer phenotype. The details here don't really matter. Suffice to say that I was interested in the heterogeneity of these cells and I was interested in the regulatory pathways that control them. So I performed a single cell RNA sequencing experiment and ultimately one day I was sent the data by my core sequencing facility and I was left with the question, OK, so now what? For me, the data analysis really was the bottleneck. So I had a couple of different options. I could either work with a bioinformatician to analyze the data, or I could spend the time learning R in order to analyze the data myself. In the end, I took a combination of both of these approaches uh, because I was very lucky to have access to a wonderful research bioinformatician. But that was very time consuming. I had to explain the biology to him and there was a lot of toing and froing to get the analysis to a state where we were both happy with it. And quite frankly, making the figures for the paper turned out to be a bit of a pain. I was always going back to him. Can you please change this? Can you please change that? And ultimately, that is what drove me to learn some R in order to generate and customize figures myself within R. To all intents and purposes, this relationship and this collaboration went very well. And we did indeed publish the paper a couple of years ago in PNES. However, this, took, this analysis took us six months to complete. And I came to the realization that there really must be a better way to do this. And Selenix is the solution here. Selenix is a cloud-based tool for the secondary analysis of single cell RNA sequencing data. It has a fast and user-friendly interface, and you can analyze your data downstream of those count matrices all the way to publication ready figures without writing a single line of code. Importantly, the code, the, the software is open source and it is completely free to use in academia for small and medium sized data sets. So who is Selenix built for? Well, it's built for two different types of people. The first type of people are biologists like me who want control over their analysis, but don't want to learn coding in order to do it. Usually these biologists need to gain biological insight quickly from their data set and they need to publish their data easily. The second group of people are bioinformaticians who work with biologists. And Preeti here is a classic example. She is a research bioinformatician at Harvard Medical School, and she works with many biologists, uh, several biologists on many data sets. She doesn't want to waste her time doing the standard repetitive analysis. She wants to focus on the big bioinformatics challenges. So therefore, she needs a tool that enables biologists to explore and generate the figures for papers independently of her so that they're not bothering her with all the small questions. 
Okay, so I'm now going to show you, uh, skip to giving a live demo of Selenix so that I can show you directly what Selenix does and how it does it. As Anna already mentioned, I'm going to use this particular data set in order to show you today. This is a lung cancer atlas that was generated using Singleron technology. And of course, the paper and the data set are both available open access. So I'm now going to change to showing you Selenix. You should now see the Selenix interface. Just a little bit of navigation is that we have four modules within Selenix. I'm not going to show you the data management module today, just for the simplicity that I have already uploaded the data and the metadata in advance. Uh, and I can show you that another time, hopefully, if you attend one of those workshops. What I am going to show you are the three downstream analysis modules, and I'm starting here on the data processing module. For any data set that is uploaded to Selenix, we automatically run our seven step data processing pipeline. And this pipeline runs with automatically determined default values. These default values are calculated according to the spread of each sample data. And I can show you an example of that in a moment. So the first five steps of our data processing pipeline are filtering steps, and I, can, I will take you through those. And then the sixth step is the integration of multi-sample data sets. And then the final step is where you can configure your UMAP or TISNI embedding and your clustering settings. You will immediately spot that the first two filters here are already disabled. The reason for that is that I have taken the singular on count matrices that were output from Celescope that Anna just talked about, and I uploaded those directly to Selenix. Selenix recognized that the empty wells, in this case with singular on technology, the empty wells have already been removed from the data set, and Selenix detected that and therefore disabled these first two filters accordingly. But if you had a data set that had not been pre-filtered, either a singular on data set or from other technologies like Tenex, then you can these, these two filters would be enabled and you can remove the empty wells or indeed empty droplets from the data set. But for the demo today, I'm going to start here on filter three. This is the mitochondrial content filter where the dead and dying cells can be removed from your data set. You can see here that we have a couple of different plot views for viewing the data and that the samples are listed vertically so you can very easily scroll through them. Underneath each plot, you will see that there is a statistical table that tells you how many cells are being removed in this specific uh, step of the data processing pipeline. And on the right hand side here, you can see that, of course, you can overrule any of the automatically determined settings using the manual button. Let me move the zoom controls out the way. <laughs> so there, if I select that manual button, I can then move the slider here in order to move the, the threshold that I'm setting for this particular sample. You can see that the red line is jumping around here as I'm moving that slider, but I'm not going to rerun the pipeline right now during this demo, so I'm going to discard that. Okay, on to the next filtering step. Step four is the genes versus UMIs filter, where we expect a linear relationship here and any cells that are outside of these two red lines, we would determine those as low quality cells and they are filtered out of the data set. The final filtering step is step five, is where we remove doublets and multiplets from the data set. We use the SCDBL finder method in order to do this, and you will see that, this, that the threshold is set according to the spread of the data. So therefore, that threshold, that red line, is in a different place for each sample because it's calculated on a per sample basis. OK, moving on from the filtering steps, step six is now the data integration step. We use the Harmony data integration method by default, but of course you can use any of the other data integration methods that we have available. And we have a couple of different plot views for you to determine whether your data are well integrated or not. We have the UMAP embedding plot, and here the second one on the list is that we have a frequency plot. And underneath here, we also show the elbow plot for calculating the number of dimensions that you would like to take forward in, in your analysis. All of these plots, by the way, can be fully customized and exported for publication. Okay, moving on to the final step of the data processing module. We're now on step seven. This is where the embedding is configured. So you can choose the UMAP or TISNI embedding. And down below here, you can see that there are the clustering settings. We use the Louvain clustering method by default, and you can easily control the clustering resolution using this resolution slider here. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on now to the other modules of the platform. The next module is the data exploration module, and this is where we find that biologists spend most of their time annotating their clusters and really getting into the nitty gritty of the biology of their data set and finding interesting things about this data set. So on the top here, we have the UMAP embedding that we just configured in the final step of the data processing module. We then have our list of clusters here, our list of genes and a marker heat map underneath. It's very, very easy to view, to color the embedding by the expression of a particular gene or by specific metadata. So here we have sample or we have cancer type, for example. And underneath we have a marker heat map where you where this will help you to identify what a specific cluster is. So this is cluster nine and you can zoom in that these are the marker genes for cluster nine and that, that will help you to understand what those uh, what those cells are that are represented, what cell type is represented in cluster nine. So for the purposes of the demo, I'm going to show you two things and uh, reproduce two findings from this paper that was introduced to us. So the first finding that the paper talks about is the heterogeneity in T cell, the presence of T cells across the multiple samples in this cancer cell atlas. So for that, I'm going to search for a T cell marker so that I can very quickly find which population are T cells. So I've searched for CD2. This is a classic T cell marker. And we can see it looks like this cluster up here probably are, are T cells. So I'm going to use a very rough and ready approach. I'm just going to grab this lasso tool and I am going to draw a Sorry, I have um, managed to select the CD2 somehow. So I'm just, I don't know how to get rid of that. So I'm going to refresh the page just to get rid of that CD2 button there. Apologies for the delay. The good thing is that Selenix is very much still under development. So I will report that to our engineers and it will be fixed in the next couple of days. <laughs> Okay, so as again, um, I'm just going to grab the lasso tool here and I am going to use that lasso tool to circle, it doesn't seem to want to work this morning, apologies for this, circle those T cells that are highlighted by the expression of that CD2. And then I'm going to use this magic button down here, so I now have a new custom cell set that is our T cells. And I'm going to use this complement button so that I get a new cell set that is everything else. So that's non T cells, basically. So if I color my embedding by these two new custom clusters, you will see that I have my T cells and my non T cells. I could, of course, perform differential expression to compare those T cells versus non T cells if I wanted a full list of marker genes. Or indeed, I could compare those T cells across specific uh, samples or across specific groups. So, for example, I might be interested in comparing the different cancer types and looking at the, the differential expressed genes in that T cell subset between my different cancer groups. But I'm not going to do that right now. What I'm going to do is go to the plots and tables module, which is the final module of Selenix, where we have a range of different plot options available for visualizing the data. And I'm going to use the frequency plot to visualize the proportion of T cells across the, the samples that we have in this data set. So what you can see is that we have indeed confirmed the findings of the paper, which is that there is a quite a difference in the proportion of these T cells across the different samples. And specifically, this P7 sample has a very high proportion of T cells compared to all of the others. And that was something that the authors commented on and that they wanted to then follow up with. OK, the other finding that the paper reported is that they were able, able to identify rare cell populations within the data set. And one, one population that they found were Th17-like cells. And they used a couple of different markers for finding those Th17-like cells, one of which we're going to look at today. And for that, we're going to use the violin plot. So the violin plot is where you can look at the expression of a particular gene. And one gene of interest but for these Th17-like cells is KLRB1. So I'm going to look for KLRB1 here in our gene list. And when the violin plot loads, you will see the expression of KLRB1 across all of our clusters. But that's not really what we want to, uh, what we want to view. These are the Leuven clusters. We can look instead at our custom cell sets. And here you can see that there is indeed a reasonable amount of KLRB1 expression within the, that T cell population that we identified. So it's likely that those there are those Th17 like cells. But again, perhaps more interestingly, is that we can look at this across 
uh, sample or across cancer type. And when we look at this across sample, what we immediately see again is that this P7 sample where we had a large proportion of T cells also has very high expression of this KLRB1 gene. Okay, so in a nutshell, I have guided you very quickly through the three main modules of Selenix. And as you can see, there are many other features available within this tool that I have not managed to show you within this webinar today. So for example, we have pathway analysis, we have many different plot options. There are many other beautiful features that I haven't managed to show you. So I would encourage you to join one of those workshops or just to check it out yourself in order to get a feel for all of the range of features that are available within Selenix. So in the meantime, I'm going to go back to my slides. Uh, let me just go directly to this slide and share them full screen so that you can see them well. So Selenix is very new and it is growing very fast. So I'm very pleased to say that it was released only 11 months ago and we have an incredible 1400 user accounts now. And these users are spending hundreds of hours per week in front of the tool. So, so clearly we're doing something right, which I'm very pleased to see. As I mentioned, Selenix is still very much under development. We have an active team of engineers who are working hard to bring new features and to fix any small things that go wrong, uh, such as earlier on, which I will report that and get that fixed. So the next feature that we have that's coming soon is trajectory analysis. Uh, that will be using the monocle method, and we are very pleased that that will be live, hopefully in the next four to six weeks. So do watch this space, and you can see here a list of other features that, we're, that are currently in development. So finally, just to conclude my story, as you can clearly tell, I have switched out my lab coat and my wet lab reagents for my laptop and for Selenix. I could reproduce the results from my own paper and indeed from any other paper, such as the Singleron paper that we just looked at just now in the demo. I can reproduce those results in under an hour using Selenix. And the total analysis time for a new data set that you might be working on is cut down from six months that it took me working with a bioinformatician and learning R to just two weeks in Selenix. So I quit my academic job in order to make sure that Selenix is properly designed and built for researchers. And for that, I would really love to hear your feedback. So if you do manage to check out the tool, please do let me know what you think of it. There's a feedback button at the top of Selenix, or you can email me directly because I would love to hear your feedback so that we can continue to improve the tool. So if what you've seen today sounds interesting and you'd like to give it a shot yourself and you'd like to give it a try, I would encourage you to do so. You can sign up today, create an account and start your analysis at this link here, it's scp.biomage.net. And as I've mentioned, you can join one of our upcoming workshops. The details, full details are available on our website here, biomage.net forward slash upcoming dash events. So that just leaves me to say, thank you very much for your attention. It's wonderful to be here. And I'm very happy to take questions together with Anna in the panel discussion that's about to happen. Thank you, both of you. Uh, for the very informative talk. Um, yeah, so we can start the discussion panel. Please like, write your questions in the Q&A section. Um, okay, so the first question is about single runs technologies. And the question is if the technology needs um, any device for generating a library. No, so the library, you just need the chip and our kit, and it's just like generating any bulk RNA sequencing library. It's the same exact steps. So it doesn't need any specialized instrument. So the second question, uh, my data is unpublished, so I'm worried about uh, data security. Uh, how secure is uh, Selenix? Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so Selenix is hosted on Amazon Cloud, AWS Cloud, which is a completely secure cloud service. So there are no other Selenix users will have access to your data, only you and anyone that you share it with within the Selenix uh, platform using the share capabilities. The Biomage team do have access to your data that is used only to improve the tool. So essentially we use your data in order to 
train our data processing pipeline, but that data would never be shared anywhere outside of Biomage and would certainly not be shared with any other user. So we've never had a security breach. We're very pleased about that. And we value your data privacy as our, one of our highest, um, highest priorities. Full details of our privacy policy, of course, are available to you when you log into Selenix and on our, uh, and on our website at biomage.net. Mm -hmm. Um, then about Telescope, it is asked if it is free. Telescope is free, you can just go to GitHub and download it. And it's very simple to use, just have to input your uh, password files. And you have to set a few um, parameters and then it runs and outputs the report that I showed you before. And then we end the gene expression matrix that you can then out input into Selenix, for example. How does Selenix uh, work on the bioinformatics side? Good question. Selenix is essentially based in R, so we use an R object on the back end. And you can, of course, export that R object from Selenix if you would like to do some custom downstream analysis that is not available yet in the tool. So, for example, if you wanted to do trajectory analysis right now and we don't have that available yet, you can download that R object and take that back into R and do that yourself. Essentially, our pipeline has mirrored the Surat pipeline, but we're not restricted to Surat. So we offer um, other features that are that are not available within Surat. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. And uh, for more information, visit our website at www.singlerun.bio. Uh, if there is any question left, and we are running out of time right now, just feel free to write us an email at um, <coughs> info at sign singlerunbio.com. Uh, don't forget to uh, check out our YouTube channel and also follow us on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.